I'm recording this in June of 2218. The world looks nothing like it ever has before. Money and how we use it is vastly different from previous centuries. Nothing is what it used to be. Not partnerships, not families, not friendships or relationships. I, I guess that's bound to happen when you live exponentially longer. But to tell the story, let me take you back nearly 200 years to a world very different from ours. Back in the early 21st century, reality TV stars could be presidents. Climate change was starting to have a serious impact. The first personal AI assistants were just starting to emerge, but they couldn't do much more than tell people how long it would take them to manually drive their fossil fueled vehicles to work. It will take you one hour and 20 minutes with normal traffic to reach your office. It's dawn on the 8th of June, 2018. There have been several births overnight here in the maternity ward of St. Mary's Hospital, Mtata. The newest arrival is a lively baby girl. Her mother is a maths teacher. Her father works in IT. Her parents will call her Lisedi. Lisedi Ndaba. She's set to become the world's first 200-year-old. And this is the story of how she got here. My name is Sam Gwenya. I'm a South African journalist and podcaster in 2218. And this is The 200-Year-Old. Scientists predict that the first person to live to 200 may have already been born. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. As Sunlam turns 100 this year, they're looking ahead at what fundamental changes might take place in the world so that we can plan better for the future. Now, if you told someone all the way back in 2018 that the first 200-year-old was already born, they would have thought you were crazy. Well, actually, that's not quite true. It would depend on who you were talking to. If you were sitting in Dr. Aubrey de Grey's lab in California, you would have heard that living to 200 was not only possible, but entirely probable. My name is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and I am the Chief Science Officer of Sense Research Foundation, which is a biomedical research charity based in California, focused on developing new therapies that will undo and repair the molecular changes and the cellular changes of aging. That was an archive recording from all the way back in 2018. Dr. Aubrey de Grey was one of the leading voices in anti-aging therapies at the time. Uh, Ever since the dawn of civilization, humans have known that there is this thing called aging, which happens to you if nothing else does. And it happens to you at a reasonably predictable age, and it's really, really horrible. It's a very slow and painful death. And... We haven't been able to do anything about it, and we haven't had any realistic prospect of being able to do anything about it in the foreseeable future until now. We are interested in developing new medicines that will keep people functioning, both mentally and physically, however long ago they were born, in the same kind of state as they were when they were young adults. I'll let that sink in. Even in 2018, they felt it was medically possible to not only make people live longer, but also to keep them biologically young adults. Once we've seen what aging is, that it's just the accumulation of damage in the same way that it is in a car or whatever, then it's easy to see that the right way, the most common sense way to keep people in a good state of health at an age when they normally wouldn't be is periodic, comprehensive, preventative maintenance. Of course, the interventions are more sophisticated, more numerous, more complicated, because the body is more complicated. These early pioneers weren't necessarily trying to make us live forever. They just wanted us not to die of cancer, not to die of heart disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, and the many other diseases we suffered from in old age. The sensible way to do that, some argued, was not just to beat the diseases of old age, but to prevent aging in the first place. To stop or at least slow down the gradual buildup of damage that we call aging. Today, I'm with Lisedi in one of several homes she subscribes to. This one is near the Eastern Cape Coast. 
Now, this place is decorated with beautiful mid-21st century antiques. There are tons of pictures of the family on every wall. Each one has a name under it. Some of them I know, most of them I don't. It's Lissetti's 200th birthday in a few days and I'm a little anxious. You know, getting her to talk to me on the record hasn't been easy. I haven't seen her in person since I was a child, when she came to my eighth birthday. All right, are you ready to begin? <laughs> are you ready? Lissetti looks far from her 200 years old, perhaps more like someone biologically in their 60s. But in this day and age, looks can be deceptive, as I'll explain a bit later. Lissetti, I want to go back to the moment you realized you weren't going to have a normal life expectancy. Coco, Lissetti. Isn't that what you children call me now? <coughs> oh, are we going to be all formal about this? Yeah, Colisa. Coco. Now, was there a moment you realized that you would be living so much longer than everyone else? <sighs> No, not really one moment. It's not like somebody handed me a pill and said, take this, you will live to 200. <laughs> it happened gradually over time. You get told there's a chance you might live another 20 to 30 years beyond your expectations. But nothing is certain at that point. Mm. Down the line, there are new developments and they tell you it might be even longer. But it gradually began to sink in that I needed to start making some serious plans. Mm -hmm. I remember I was a few years away from retirement. My first job was as an oncologist. Do you know what that is? Uh, no. It was a doctor specializing in cancer. But in my 60s, that was around 2080, mm -hmm. oncology research was becoming obsolete. We were curing many cancers and the AIs were integrating into our roles to the point that there was less demand for doctors in that field. Nurses, yes, but doctors, we weren't needed like we were before. So for me, it was supposedly time to start winding things down. Plus my children were all nearly grown up. But you had other plans. I still had so much energy. And I was told that there was a good chance I'd be physically healthy for maybe another 60 years, probably more. Mm. I had reached retirement age chronologically, but biologically, I was still in my 30s. So, I took time off to travel the world. Mm. And why you? You know, what makes you the first 200-year-old? <laughs> Luck, <laughs> if you want to call it that. And being foolish enough to take part in the early trials. I took care of myself, and I had an unfair genetic head start as well. Coco Lucedi is talking about a variant of the Fox 03A gene. If you lived to over 100 years old in previous centuries, chances are you had this. It meant that there was less damage to fix as I, as I aged. So while there were other people in those early trials too, something in the aging process tripped them up at some point. Hmm. I was the only one of that era that stuck around long enough to benefit from the next wave of therapies. So what you're telling me is that you had a 10 or 15 year head start on the next oldest human being alive. Did, what's her name, that, that woman in Malaysia? Yep, that, that's her. She's a bit jealous of me, I think. <laughs> She's probably worried that nobody will remember the second 200-year-old. <laughs> and of course, you... you looked after yourself. Absolutely. You know, I ate right, and I ran a lot. Every race and marathon I could find. I didn't think of it in terms of longevity at the time. I, I just enjoyed it. I wanted to improve my quality of life. Hmm. And, um, diet? I mean, did you, did you eat something different to everybody else that maybe gave you a bit of a head start? Is there some secret recipe? No, not really. I just always ate sensibly. Being a doctor, I knew how important it was. But exercise and diet only gets you so far. Hmm. Being healthy helped me stick around for the next wave of medical breakthroughs. I'm going back to 2018 again at this point. 
This is Dr. Aubrey de Grey explaining what he calls longevity escape velocity. This is how Lissetti got to be sitting with me today. So you can imagine someone who's aged, let's say, 60, and you give them these first-generation therapies that I think we've got a good chance of developing in the next 20 years. And they won't be biologically 60 again in the sense of having the same amount of damage in their bodies um, until they're 90, let's say. But then the therapies don't work anymore because the difficult damage is not repaired by those therapies. So what I'm figuring out is that the secret to our remarkable longevity seems to be just staying alive long enough to wait for scientists to find the next solution. And the next. And the next. Thing is, though, in those 30 years, research will have continued. And we will have developed therapies that work better, that actually do repair some, albeit still not all, of the difficult damage, as well as the easy damage. So we will be able to take this 90-year-old who's biologically 60 for the second time and re-rejuvenate them so that they won't be biologically 60 for the third time until they're, let's say, 150, and so on. And so basically what I've called longevity escape velocity is simply the minimum rate at which we need to continue to improve the comprehensiveness of these repair therapies in order to be able to stay one step ahead of the problem for a given individual, a given beneficiary of the therapies. As so, eventually your new reality started to sink in that you were going to live much longer. How do you then react? Hmm. You know, I'm a very practical person and my life had been so busy till that point. My first husband and I both worked very hard. We'd raised our children. I'd saved enough money to retire comfortably. So at that point in the trial, when it really started to work, two things became blindingly obvious. Firstly, if I continued with my current life plans of retiring, I was going to run out of money decades before I was expected to die. And secondly, somewhere in the next few decades, I was going to get very, very bored. <laughs> now, let me get this straight. You were married to your first husband, we'll see her at that point. That's right. And you had been together a long time. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing there was going to be a difficult conversation at some point. I mean, here he was, aging, let me say normally, and um, you on the other hand weren't. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> he had a massive decision to make then too. Whether he wanted to try and join me on the journey to extend both our lives together, or maybe not. So, what did he decide? He decided not to. That must have been a very difficult conversation. Yeah. We couldn't afford it for one thing, not for both of us. These were the early days. If you weren't part of the early trials, the costs were huge. And there was such social pressure as well. Many people hated the idea. I mean, really, really hated it. And he was influenced by that, I think. You know, we never did divorce. It's clearly an uncomfortable conversation for Okoko. So we took a break and we stepped outside for a bit. Now we are on the coastal path that runs alongside the house. There's a strong smell of seaweed blowing up from the beach. It's winter, so there are no signs of anyone else as far as the eye can see. So, um, your husband didn't extend his life and you did. Mm -hmm. That must have been the first for the world at that time. Mm -hmm. mm, tell me about it. Besides what my first husband and I had to go through, many others, including many close members of our family, they disagreed with what I was doing. Some violently. I mean, they, they felt that it went against the natural order of things. So then what makes you keep going? Did you want to live forever, no matter the cost? Oh, heavens, no, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> Sammy, remember I was a doctor. Oh, yes. I wanted to help fight the illnesses that brought misery to so many people. I'd seen what that looked like my entire career. Like, uh, my duty to step up. You know, now when I think about all that nonsense that was said about the natural order of things, yeah. I realize there's no such thing as a natural order. There's change, and there is our ability to deal with that change. 
So we either adapt or we don't. Adapt or die. Now, how many times has history taught us that lesson? Police were dispatched to a protest outside an anti-aging research center in downtown Johannesburg this morning. The foundation, referred to by some critics as an immortality clinic, was ransacked and a number of people were As society realized the implications of the fight against aging, a huge rift opened up between people who wanted access and those who violently opposed us crossing the line we were about to cross in science. I can understand the fear that the issue stoked up. I mean, it highlighted the massive and brutal changes that were coming our way, whether we liked it or not. Changes that would affect everything from employment to economics. No wonder people felt so strongly about it. This is Dr. Aubrey de Grey again in 2018. I think when people worry about and try to think about a society that is post-aging, where we just don't have these problems of uh, ill health associated with old age anymore, then usually the mistake that they make, in fact, the hugely, overwhelmingly ubiquitous mistake that is made, is to presume that everything else is going to be more or less the same as it is today. People just completely put out of their minds the fact that we've already got the solution to climate change, for example, happening with the, um, uh, the sea change shift towards um, renewable energy and artificial meat and desalination and stuff like that. And the fact that automation is going to eliminate most of the jobs that we have, uh, you know, and so that we'll have to have a completely different system of distribution of wealth than what we have in a world of full employment. So Ukokoli said he was living right on the edge of the wave of change and uncertainty. She had to face down all that criticism from society and even her own family. Now, Kokoli said, considering how long you've lived, you've probably had to deal with more change than most. Do you think you've dealt with it very well? Or? <laughs> no, heavens, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Never. But I don't believe I was equipped emotionally. I wasn't prepared. Neither was the family. But how could I have been? I mean, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. And uh, what were you getting yourselves into, actually? I think as you get older, you see these waves of change coming. And they get faster, and they get faster. You reach a point where you're just not sure if you want to keep up anymore. At the beginning of this project, I assumed that being the first 200-year-old would be such an amazing adventure. But the thing is, up until this point, we've always had a template for our lives. All of the experiences of all of humankind who came before us for thousands of years are available as an example to us of how to live and how to grow old. I mean, we can refer to great literature, works of journalism, art, reality TV, conversations with older generations. But as Lissetti went beyond the limits of previous humans, she outlived her goals, her expectations, and many of the people she came to love. She was truly off the map. Perhaps it will be easier for those who come after you. Hmm. Perhaps. So, with your 200th birthday coming up. And then, something changes with her. She stops mid-stride. Her eyes are looking at something far away. I need to tell you something. Oh, Lenam, I don't know that it's going to happen. This may not happen. Wait, 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 wait. Um, Coco, Lissedi. And then she flickers out of sight. I'm left on my own. I guess when you're almost 200 years old, you've earned the right to make a dramatic exit. I should explain, though, that while our conversations were real, they took place inside a virtual meeting space. One of the spaces from her personal archive. I have no idea if the Lissetti that I just met with is what she really looks like now. That's just the downside of a virtual meeting space. There's so much that can be altered or hidden, which is something that does concern me. So while I don't know where Coco Lucetti is in the flesh, 
I do make contact with her again. And what's clear is that while the world is expecting the birthday of the first 200-year-old, that potential 200-year-old may be having some doubts about it. In the next episode of The 200-Year-Old, is it possible that Coco Lissetti won't live to see 200 after all? Can we talk about what you said at the end of our last conversation? I explore the financial dilemma of living to 200. The economic impact will be just like, there's no way to describe it. If you're going to live forever, when on earth do you retire? Sam, take a tip from a very old woman. Make sure that you take a retirement at least every 30 or to 40 years. How on earth could Lissetti afford it? She should have been completely broke 30 years ago. All that and more next time on The 200-Year-Old. This podcast is brought to you by Sunlum. To subscribe, visit www.the200yearold.co.za. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. To find out more about the research that went into this episode, ask the 200-year-old a question on Twitter at 200-year-old. That's at 200-year-old. If you like this episode, please rate it and leave a review on your podcast platform.